So for our patients who have OSA, sleep apnea, or, uh, or have the larger or thicker, shorter necks, their airways may obstruct a little bit easier than, than our regular patients. So sometimes just a simple uh, adjustment of their neck with a chin tilt can, uh, can restore that airway for them. Uh, avoid uh, placing weight on a patient. If you're gonna hold a patient, uh, just brace them, place a hand on their head uh, to prevent them from bucking up, um, but don't put extra weight on it because that may trigger feelings of being confined or restrained. Now, I know that's not always possible, as, especially as patients become more restless. Um, but if you, if you are able to just kind of place your hand on them, um, then it's better than putting weight on them. Uh, use a calm voice, talk patients through procedure. Uh, strive to keep the patient in full view. Um, avoid turning your back on patients, particularly during tenuous times uh, during the procedure. Um, just because you always want to be at the ready to, to help calm them or brace them if, if need be. And pay attention to ergonomics and positioning for, for both yourself and the patient. Your CPs can be particularly hard on the body with the extra weight of the lead especially. And also in cases that are long um, or when a patient requires a lot of bracing or reassurance, you're, you're often bent over the patient's head. For that time so just be mindful of that and try try to try to avoid that if you can so once the procedure is done uh, we uh, take the patient back to our recovery room and where we monitor their vital signs um, assess the responsiveness will they be requiring a reversal agent or do they or do they uh, rouse to verbal stimuli uh, assess for abdominal pain, and you can always uh, compare that to their pre-procedure pain levels too. That's an, a good indicator. Um, obviously, we're not going to fix somebody's uh, surgical pain that they had pre-procedure. It's always nice to know that a uh, patient hasn't or is not experiencing any pain after the procedure. However, if, if they are having pain, is it the same pain that they've had before or is it different? Um, are they having nausea, vomiting? Are they feverish? Uh, some of this can or may require additional anal analgesics or antiemetics. Um, however, if it does persist, the endoscopist may order some blood work um, or some Im imaging to try to rule out any of those uh, complications that uh, Dr. Forbes had mentioned earlier, pancreatitis, bleeding, perforation. Um, also, if a patient has had a stent placed, uh, particularly metal stents can be uncomfortable just because they do expand for a period afterwards, and that expansion might cause a bit of discomfort. Or the pain may be as simple as some gas distension. So if they're able to burp it out, um, that, that might help them. Um, assess for Molina, hematemesis, drop in blood count, or changes in their hemodynamic dynamic status, and that might not uh, show for a few days afterwards, not in the immediate uh, post-ERCP period. Next slide, please. For our uh, patients who are going home afterwards, remind them that they are legally impaired for the remainder of the day. So caution against operating motorized vehicles, signing any legal documents, or drinking any alcohol. Um, however, they usually are sent home DAT so they can eat whatever they'd like. Uh, remind them of the signs and symptoms to look out for to seek medical attention like pain, nausea, vomiting, fever. Uh, if any of those are not relieved by home remedies or are worsening in nature, then they should seek med medical attention as, as well as uh, if they're experiencing any melina or hematemesis. And for our patients who have OSA, uh, remind them to use their CPAP or BiPAP if they're feeling drowsy or they're, or they're gonna lay down for a little bit. Thanks, Maggie. That's a really thorough sort of a look at what, um, you know, what needs to be done to keep patients safe. Uh, what Maggie's underselling, in my opinion, is just, the, again, the contribution of, 
of you know both sedating and assisting RNs to the actual case. So uh, the communication piece that Maggie alluded to is really key. So Maggie's very, very modest, but the, the reality is that Maggie is way smarter when it comes to ERCP than I am. And uh, she's probably forgotten more about ERCP than I know. Uh, and that's, again, that's going to be the reality for, for most of you if, you if you sort of make a career out of being in the ERCP unit. Uh, so you have to recognize, again, put the patient first and weigh in. Um, and, you know, oftentimes, uh, Maggie knows this, you know, I'll ask um, the assisting nurse frequently for their ideas and their suggestions. Uh, and, you know, again, if we can drive down that, that pancreatitis rate, um, you know, with efficient teamwork and communication and ideas, like the time, you know, the time for ERCP is not a time for, for ego. Uh, it's a time to, to just do what's best for the patient. So again, uh, you know, as you get that comfort level, if you're a new ERCP nurse, you know, do, do weigh in and, and sort of, you know, speak up and be the patient's advocate because they can't. 